Our next speaker is Dr. Scott Kurashige, who teaches ethnic studies at the University of Washington Bothell. He's going to, he's also a board member with the Detroit-based organization, the James and Grace Lee Bogg Center to Nurture Community Leadership. He will discuss the policing of space and race with us today. Please welcome him to the podium. Okay, thank you for that introduction. Um, really want to thank the organizers, especially all the people doing the work behind the scenes. It's obviously uh, not always uh, visible. Um, I'm really honored to be here with this incredible panel and really to be in your presence uh, on this day. And I just want to jump right into it. Um, so when Darren Wilson testified before the grand jury, the prosecutor asked him if he was on, quote, high alert when he first spot spotted Michael Brown. Yes, Wilson answered, characterizing that section of Ferguson as, quote, not a very well-liked community, a hostile environment marked by an influx of gang activity, and a lot of gun activity, drug activity. It's an anti-police area for sure, Wilson added. That's not an area where you can take anything, really. So we get a clear sense of how Wilson was justifying the militarized police presence in Ferguson and the, uh, his itchy trigger finger. And though he doesn't say anything explicit about race in these responses, he relies upon racially coded language to denigrate the population of a city that by then was roughly two-thirds African American. So how did we get to this point where segregation can be so concentrated and st stigmatization and demonization, literally in the case of Mike Brown, who was referred to as a demon by Darren Wilson, of communities of color can become so common sense in the minds of too many abusive cops and their defenders. Ferguson's demographics were once quite different. The inner ring suburb was essentially built by white flight, roughly tripling in size during the post-World War II suburban boom. At its peak population in 1970, Ferguson was 99% white. Whites were, during this time, abandoning St. Louis. The city was once home to 850,000 people in 1950, but is barely one third that size now. And as St. Louis shrunk, the percentage of its black population soared from 13% before World War II to about one half now. So this is a trend we've seen, especially in the deindustrialized Rust Belt, but also in some form throughout the nation. Blacks leaving the exploitation and sharecropping of sharecropping and the violent oppression of the Jim Crow South, moving to urban areas in the North, Midwest, and West Coast, but constantly having to struggle against discrimination to get decent jobs and housing. Space opens up in the city really only as whites flee to the suburbs, taking advantage of generous post-war subsidies for housing, business development, education, and massive public spending on freeways, infrastructure, and defense industry plans. People were not so much against stimuluses uh, back then. <laughs> they took jobs and resources with them to the suburbs while urban renewal, redlining, and deindustrialization ravaged those communities left behind. Government policies and corporate practices therefore figuratively police space. But the state also literally police space. As police forces embraced a two-sided mission, protecting and serving white neighborhoods, and suburbs by confining and repressing far too often to the point of outright abuse and brutality black and brown communities. And they're starting to get more resources uh, and, and authority in that process too. It is understandable, therefore, that black populations have also left cities and, uh, for suburbs over the past three to four decades. But the suburbs have not proved to be any exit from this white supremacist order. <laughs> we see what happens in inner ring suburbs like Ferguson but we also see what happens in outer suburbs like Sanford, Florida, where Trayvon Martin lived in a gated community that was only 20% black. Black subjects get profiled when they fit the local demographics in places like Ferguson and profiled when they don't fit the local demographics in places like Sanford. Now, nowhere is this pattern of racism, segregation, suburbanization, and the policing of space more blatant or stark than Detroit, where I just uh, moved from last year. Once one of the nation's most wealthy and white cities in the US and the world, Detroit has become infamous for its abandonment, poverty, and now bankruptcy and state takeover. And I want to talk about three cases of black women and girls murdered, two by the police and one by a vigilante in Detroit and its suburbs. Ayanna Stanley Jones was a seven-year-old girl 
killed in her own home in, in 2010 after the Detroit SWAT team threw a flash grenade through her front window after they had the wrong address for the sub suspect they were looking for, stormed the house and opened fire. The entire militarized spectacle was seen as befitting the occupying army tactics of police on Detroit's east side, where poverty, unemployment, school closures, foreclosed homes, and vacant lots are the norm. It was indeed such a spectacle that the SWAT team was actually performing on tape for an A&E reality TV show when they bombed Ayanna Stanley Jones's house. But the officer who killed her has escaped conviction due to hung juries and uh, has repeatedly seen the most serious charges against him dismissed. The second case I want to talk about involves Renisha McBride, who was a 19-year-old Detroit woman who sought help from residents when she crashed her car and became disoriented in the suburb of Dearborn Heights in 2013. She wound up on the porch of a white homeowner named Theodore Wafer, who answered the knock on his door and proceeded to shoot unarmed Renisha McBride in the face through a screen door, killing her. Activists demanded justice, and the fact that McBride was not a cop was probably a significant factor in his being charged and convicted of second-degree murder. Most recently, Ara Rosser, a 40-year-old black woman, was killed just last November by police responding to a call for assistance with a, uh, with a domestic conflict by quickly shooting her after she was spotted holding a knife that was likely a cooking utensil. Rosser had moved 40 miles away from Detroit to the wealthy and majority white city of Ann Arbor, which fashions itself to be a very liberal college town but where the main product, uh, where the main thing produced is white denial. <laughs> While the city initially, initially released no information about the officer who shot Rosser, the local press decided to assassinate her character by framing her as a crack addict who had multiple run-ins with the authorities. So these are the patterns that are giving rise to a black person, and let's remember that includes those identifying as male, female, and genderqueer being killed every 28 hours by police or vigilantes. The rights secured on paper through the movement struggles leading up to Selma have never been actualized. White flight to more distant suburbs and the building of privatized gated communities have been strategies to preserve race and class inequality and privilege. Meanwhile, the near suburbs have increasingly become sites of segregation and disinvestment too. And what is happening to the inner cities? We know some neighborhoods have been completely written off, marked for disinvestment and abandonment by the public and private sectors. Detroit is actually closing down some neighborhoods. And yet at the same time, we see that militarized policing, sweeping youth off the streets and into prisons, disrupting informal economies of survival, and deforming public education into neoliberal boot camps, serves an economic and political purpose as many urban areas are targeted for repopulation and reoccupation. What we are seeing in Detroit explicitly is that the principal demands and gains of civil rights and black power movements, the right to vote and community control, are being swept away by a bankruptcy process that instituted an autocratic emergency management regime run by an appointee of the Republican governor who has granted dictatorial control over all financial and political matters. Disenfranchised Disenfranchisement, dispossession, gentrification, and incarceration were therefore uh, facilitated and eased through by this process. But they're taking place through varying methods everywhere. And I don't have to tell you they're happening right here in this city, too. So this is what we're confronting. On the one hand, we see the Bob McCulloughs, the police union leaders, the Wall Street Titans, and the Monsantos telling us quite clearly that they feel no shame no remorse, and no desire to apologize or compromise. They are symptomatic of a regime that seeks to rule through brute force, one that will exist primarily for the few to plunder what planetary and human resources remain at the direct, direct expense of the survival of the many. Uh, like the train in the movie Snowpiercer, they seek only to extend their immediate ride with little regard for long-term sustainability. But out of the struggle to define how and why black lives matter, out of the vacant lots and abandoned buildings of Detroit and other cities, out of the global cities where white flight has given rise to polyculturalism and third world majorities and solidarity, 
we can now see alternative pathways to neoliberal disaster and extinction. Radical activists do not seek ultimately a better status or promotion within an unsustainable system or a dying empire. They and we are creating examples of solidarity economics and environmental justice, urban farms to promote food sovereignty, community-based models of safety and restorative justice so we don't have to rely on the state to protect us, feminist and genderqueer models of care, affinity, and creativity, and transformative liberatory modes of education. And that's really what's at stake in the struggles today. Not a better or worse existence under this current system or this current state, but two alternative futures, one that's uh, potentially worse than the system we have now and one that could be much more humane and better. Thank you. <laughs>